get started. I hate to start late. In fact, I have a pension for that. Uh, my name is Gary Anderson. If you don't know me, I'm producing artistic director for Plowshares Theater Company. I'd like to welcome you here to our first uh, artist salon series. We're kicking these off in part as a celebration of our 30th anniversary of being around. Plowshares was started, established in 1989. We began producing our first show in 1990, and over the course of the last three decades, we've continued to do work. I think we've been we've done some good work around here, worked with a number of talented artists, and actually have brought into the to the theater community here people who playwrights, actors, and designers who may not have ever been recognized in this area before. And we are now looking forward to uh, continuing that in the fall. Of year with our first fully realized production season in a few years. We want to get off, kick it off with uh, having a conversation about what is the medium of, of black theater. There's a lot of confusion right now, um, I perceive, that people have in regards to what exactly black theater is. And so we like to have a conversation around that to get some context. Like with anything, you need to know the historical background of things so that you have a better idea as to you know when you're identifying and what you're identifying. So you have um, a clear sense of, there is a clear set of criteria that distinguishes black theater from any other part of the American theater movement. There are clear objectives that it has, and those have been in place in part because of the treatment and conditions that African Americans have sort of lived under in this country for 400 years. They are inextricably linked in how we have conducted ourselves as artists and how we have been dealt with in a society that originally considered us at the same time not human but three fifths of a person. So we couldn't vote, but we could be counted in the census. So the southern states could have some balance. Nevertheless, let me just get off to start with a quote that I love by an activist who I think is extremely important. By Audre Lorde, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies about me and eaten alive. And that's really the context that African Americans have found themselves in this country. Be, have, be, how we were brought into this country as property subjugated to the will of others, we were not necessarily considered something that had any kind of viability, any kind of artistic um, agenda or traditions, and had any interest in regards to presenting ourselves in any way. And yet, that is actually part of what we've done over the course of the years. Because otherwise, what you get is this. This gentleman here is Thomas Danforth Rice, also called Danny Rice, one of the first black face performers in this country. The story goes, he was a balladeer who was traveling around in Kentucky or Virginia, some southern uh, town, walking by a plantation on a dirt road. And in the middle of the day, while everybody else was working, he saw this happy-go-lucky Negro slave who was playing a banjo and playing a dainty little jig and singing along. And that character was so animated and so interesting to him that he thought he might actually replicate that character and the song and create what he came to know for the character of Jim Crow. Yes. Which is a distorted depiction in accordance of contemporary Caucasian attitudes towards African Americans, and I'll go into that a little bit. This is the, the chart of the image of Jim Crow. So you can see how he was dressed and attired. He took a cork, burnt it in a fire, used it to darken his face, used makeup to color his, his lips so he could be red, and covered up his hands and put on raggedy clothes. And the song he sung was a song he entitled, Jumpin' Jim Crow. This character was so, so uh, celebrated 
and so recognize that, it actually, that the title of the term Jim Crow actually began to be used for laws and restrictions that were put on freed Africans after uh, the Civil War. During Reconstruction, there were all these things called Jim Crow laws, which constrained the opportunities for African Americans to find themselves in full access of their, citizen, their civil rights. And so these laws, Jim Crow laws, were actually named after this character. Again, because they made a very clear and contained attitude and idea of what a black person was. Now, one of the things that you probably noticed from the description that I said about how he came up with that song is why the hell is a Negro slave in the middle of the day on a plantation singing and dancing? <coughs> so you already have a clear idea that, that the distorted perspective of what he's presenting, the idea that someone who is on a plantation has any opportunity at all to do anything else but work from can't see in the morning to can't see at night, is not necessarily going to be able to be singing and dancing and having a good time. So however he came up with the song, however he created the character, this is what we have. Later on in the 1840s, we started having the development of minstrel shows, which were large all-male gatherings of performers who would do, who would follow the tradition by covering their faces in, in burnt cork, making uh, makeup around their mouths, and putting on wigs to cover their straight hair whether it be blonde or blue or, or gray or whatever. And in many cases, the men playing characters, female characters in these shows, would dress up as women, as you can see here. This is a poster uh, for one of the famous white uh, minstrel shows that existed. Here you have another poster for that, that, that minstrel show. And it clearly shows the distinction between the actor on the left as he would be seen walking down the street, and then how you would present him on the stage. Billy Marr, who was a comedian. In fact, later on, it, after the Civil War, many freed Africans did exactly the same thing. Those that had the ability to play an instrument, those who could sing and dance, got into the business. In fact, they sold themselves on being the real coons. You had set up there for all these years, seeing these fake coons perform, now you're going to see some real coons. And in those productions, they emulated the exact same characteristics of the, char of the characters that were presented in the all-white minstrel shows. They just now had black people doing that. Black people put on the black face. Black people wore, wore very elaborate and exaggerated um, wigs. They took on the characterizations of the characters that were originally created by whites for the minstrel show, even though they were distortions of the reality of African American people. And I'll get into that a little bit a little later. This is one of the all-black companies that cro cropped up after 1865 that performed into the early part of the 20th century. So, in those minstrel shows, there were a number of stereotypes that were, had been developed. And this is where we get into the crux about why we need a black theater movement. We're actually building that case. One of them is the Tom, or Uncle Tom. The character is dark-skinned male, usually male, asexual. Asexual, why? Because if, you, if you're a white man and you're going to leave your children or your woman around these characters, then this male cannot have a sex drive. They're subservient, self-effacing, sacrificial, and they refer to white males. I have a picture of Bill Bojangles Robinson from the films, because these characters were carried into film and television. And in fact, later on we'll talk about how some of them are still alive in the entertainment world today. And, but this is him portraying one of the butlers, or slaves, that he portrayed in one of the numerous uh, Shirley Temple movies that he did. You have to understand and be real clear about this. As I said, this whole medium started in the early part of the 19th century. In fact, the first time in America a play had been written with a black character in it where a white man played the role was 1795, a play called The Trumpet of Love. 1795, 
1832, 1840s. This is a time when our ancestors are property, and yet they are used as the, the father for the first indigenous Af uh, American entertainment form. All other uh, entertainment forms that existed in the United States were basically us copying European models. Our dance was based on ballet. Our theater was based on the European theater that existed from the ancestors who came here. Our music, again, based on European traditions. Americans created minstrel show all, all by themselves. And they used you and I as the, the raw material to create that. And they used their whole, they used their distorted assumptions about who we, who we were to create that meeting. Along with Uncle Tom, one of the other stock characters as well, I'll show you, Burt Williams, who's one of the blackface performers who actually went, not, he goes from the late 19th centuries doing menstrual shows, medicine shows, and eventually is so popular he ends up in the Ziegfeld Follies. When Ziegfeld goes to hire him, the white performers Tell the tell Ziegfeld they're willing to strike, they're willing to walk if he doesn't change his mind. Ziegfeld looks at them and well, blinking an eye, he says, Look, I can make more money with this man than I can with all the <laughs> And so they kept him. And one other thing about Burt Williams I want to highlight is so he performed continually. He had his own dressing room, he came out, he did his one act, he didn't perform at anybody else just did his act, which is basically the act that he had created in his shows prior to that. <clears throat> the night of the first Actors' Equity strike on Broadway, Burt Williams came to the theater. He went to his dressing room. He got into makeup. He noticed that he didn't get the 15-minute call before the show. <laughs> he noticed that he didn't get a 10-minute call before the show. So he walked out of his dressing room and came down to the stage. He saw that there was no stage manager. There was nobody else. In fact, the only thing on the stage was what we call the ghost light, which is a light that's staying there so people don't walk and fall off the stage or anything else. He realized that the equity actors had chosen not to share that information with him. Because you see, at that time, actors' equity was a segregated union. And he said, well, I guess they didn't think to tell me. When the strike was over, he came back. No one said anything about the problem. He didn't bring it up to anyone. He just continued to do his job. There's another little um, anecdotal story about him. Because racism is persistent, supposedly the story goes he walked into a bar one time. And he is... You can't tell from the makeup, but he is a very light-skinned, very Caucasian-featured West Indian man. Extremely handsome. But his skin is darker than a white person's skin. So he goes into this bar. He goes up to the bar bartender and he asks, um, how much is a drink of whiskey? Just, one, just one, one shot of whiskey. The bartender, after ignoring him, finally turns to him and says, I'll be a thousand dollars. And so, again, according to the story, Burt Williams pulls out of his pocket five hundred thousand dollars bills and lays them on the, on the bar and says, I'll have five. <laughs> he never was one who fought the, the blatant discrimination and, and abuse and prejudice that he received. In a ways, anything other than most most subtle manner, he was an older gentleman. Um, but there are a number of questions in regards to the images that he presented. Next next stereotype coming out of the scene that we had to deal with was the coon, dark skinned male, again asexual because you got to leave your women and your children around, so you can't be afraid of doing anything to them. Simple minded, a object of amusement, very lazy. Variation on this stereotype is the piccaninny, which is usually a child or childlike character. Think, think Buckwheat or Farina from the Little Rascals. Think 
uh, Butterfly McQueen from Gone with the Wind. But what do you love I don't know. Nothing about birthing the babies, Miss Miss Scarlet. They, you have a character, even in whether it's an adult, who is infantile in their behavior. Willie Best was probably one of the best known um, coons in in film, along with Stephen Fetchett. But we also have some modern ones, like Kevin Hart. Um, another stereotype was the mammy, who is almost exclusively dark-skinned, heavy-set, asexual, bossy. There are two variations on this stereotype. There's the Aunt Jemima, who is a distinction in regards to she's good-natured, wise, and gentle in her criticism, whereas the mammy may be extremely aggressive and angry. The, the Aunt Jemima would be more soft-spoken, more maternal in her nature. The second variation is a sapphire, which is younger, usually a young woman, who is all, usually dark skinned, although sometimes that's been modified, very sassy. And in the character's DNA, they have to be verbally abusive to black men. Think Florence in The Jeffersons, think Walona on Good Times, Pam on Martin. <laughs> This is not something that we are talking about that is dead and gone. This is something that we continually see going on. In fact, think any Gabriel Union character that has ever been in any show. Right? Modern mammies that we see are Tyler Perry's Medea, Eddie Murphy um, as Respucia, Martin Lawrence and Big Mom. Again, they continue the tradition of men dressing up as women, distorting their persona and their personality in any real sense. We also have a mulatto who is light-skinned, male or female. The, the male version is more of a is more of a, a, a 20th and 21st century um, observation, but prior to that, it's almost exclusively uh, female. Possessing Caucasian features, very sexually attractive. Two variations on the mulatto is the hot mulatto, who is an exotic sex object. Or the tragic mulatto, who is doomed to unhappiness and tragedy. show. Because of her or his biracial heritage. You have seen both of these repeatedly. The picture I have up here is of Freddie Washington, an uh, undisputed uh, fine actress who came out of the black race movie uh, movement in the early 20s and 30s. And, and her original, the original version of Imitation of Life was her biggest film. But the reason why she didn't do more films is self-evident if you look at the picture. In fact, in her films, it was required in her contract that she did not touch a white person. Because she was so light complained, because her feature was so indistinguishable on a black and white film, they would, were afraid that it would give off the impression that she was actually equal to the white character actors that she was playing. And so these were actual restrictions that occurred. And in fact, part of one of the reasons why we have Egyptian number 38, I think, is because of her and Lena Horne, who is the actress who follows her up in taking on the character of the Moana. In fact, we can look seriously at film history in the 20th century, specifically those films that have been presenting us with the characters that, the actresses who have always been presented as the example of the most attractive African American women, and they are all playing into the mulatto stereotype. Freddie Washington, Lena Horne, Dorothy Dandridge, Diane Carroll, right? You see what I'm going You got Beyonce, Jasmine Guy, Paul Patton, Halle Berry. It is consistent. And even though they may not be of mixed heritage because they are lighter, they are presented to us in that fashion. Next one is Sidney Slicker, who is dark skinned, light, or light skinned. Sometimes a woman, again, the woman variation is a modern 20th century, 21st century um, execution. Slick, polished demeanor, a cheat and a liar. 
Variation on the city slicker is Urban Hustler, who's streetwise, quick-witted, and usually with no visible means of support. Your pimps, your drug dealers, in many cases, your gangbangers, are presented in the case of being a variation on the city slicker or Urban Hustler. And this is who we slick. This is, this is Ronald O'Neill in the original 1974 um, Superfly, but you can just easily put the young man who did the movie last year in the same boat. And then we have one of the most insidious stereotypes that came out of the minstrel shows, the brutal black buck, which is always dark-skinned male, who is large in frame, possessing superhuman strength, allows passion to overrule his intellect, and may have an uncontrollable desire for white women. This is a white actor in the film Birth of a Nation, 1915, by D.W. Griffith. In this scene, the reason why these Knight Riders have captured him, he was a member of the Union forces in the, in the, in the film. This is post the end of the Civil War, where the South is devastated. And he is freed because he, is, he fought on the Union side. He comes along this plantation and he finds this beautiful, virginal, white goddess that he begins, he automatically becomes infatuated with. He chases her through the fo this forest. In fact, he chases her to this cliff. This, this story is going to take place in the South, in Georgia specifically. If y'all don't know anything else about Georgia, what y'all know? There's no cliffs. He chases the white woman to the cliff, and so he presents her with, he says to her, I love you, I want you to be my woman. He presents her with two options, right? She can either go into his arms, or she can jump off the cliff. Guess which one she chooses? Jump off the cliff. She jumps off the cliff. Her daddy comes back from town. He runs off. Her daddy goes back, comes back to town. And for some reason, he must have amazing radar. <laughs> Because he finds her dead body at the, at the bottom of the ravine where, her, where she's fallen off the cliff. And he is the, one of the people who starts to create this, this group of night riders that goes after him. So if he captures this man, then she's going to be lynched. If you, you, I know this is a grainy picture and you probably can't tell, but that is a white man under a lot of dark makeup. And that's actually the way our characters were presented on, in feature films in the subfront era, primarily played by white actors, again, carrying it over from the minstrel shows. But you've seen these other characters as well, Terry Crews and Hot Chicks, White Chicks, rather, right? And King Kong, they go into deepest, darkest Africa, they find this superhuman ape. And what is his weakness? White woman. Right? So they have used these tropes in other mediums, again, reflecting back on us. So in 1926, the author, historian, and civil rights activist, W.B. Du Bois, had had enough. And he knew that the arts were a critical tool in assisting us in creating a corrective to the circumstances that existed prior that I just described. So in 1926, in October, since he was the editor of Crisis Magazine, he didn't have to argue with nobody about writing things. <laughs> he wrote two major pieces that made a significant change in the course of artists of African descent working in this country in the theater. He wrote a piece called Little Cregum Theater Movement, the movement of a Negro theater where it was basically a call to arms to everybody who was reading that publication. And he said quite clearly, we needed to amass across this country, wherever black people existed in large quantities, the development of black theaters. And he, he defined them clearly in four major criteria. He also wrote this piece called The Criteria on the Negro Arts, also delivered in October of 2016. 1926, which he later on delivered at the Chicago Conference of the NAACP, where he said this, Thus all artists' propaganda ever will be, despite 
the wailing of purists. I stand in utter shamelessness and say that whatever art I have for writing has been done you has been used always for propaganda for gaining the rights of black folks in, to love and enjoy. I do not care a damn if any art that is not used for propaganda. I do not care when propaganda is confined to one side while the other is stripped and silent. He basically states that art for art's sake, which is a European concept about art, is ridiculous. That art has to be political, that art has to make a statement, that art has to teach a lesson. And although he doesn't know this, when he writes this, he's connecting back to a West African tradition in regards to how the, the arts play. So he was actually hearing the drumbeat of his ancestors, whether he realized it or not, when he was writing that down. So there is no opportunity for us to create sheer entertainment. We are about correcting the circumstances under which our people exist in this country. And if we are not interested in that job, that's fine. Then don't call yourself an artist. And specifically, don't call yourself a black theater artist. Because he's making it very plain. There is one course. And he gives you the description of what those are. He says black theater should be about black people. That is to say, the plays must reflect African American life as it is, not as others interpret it. This is not something written by somebody else about us. This is not the Green Mile. This is not the help. By black people, the practitioners must be African American with an understanding from birth and continual association just what it means to be African American today. Now, you can't take vacations from being black, is basically what he's saying. For black people, the theater must cater primarily to an African-American office audience while it is supported and sustained by